up, you guys? Today is Book Club Friday. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm glad you decided to join me today. So before we get into our book club reading, I just wanted to let you know the book that we will be reading or that we are reading along with what chapter we on today. So here is our book. We are reading Discerning the Voice of God, How to Know When God is Speaking by Priscilla Shira, who is the daughter of Dr. Tony Evans. And today we are starting with chapter four, what's better than a burning bush. And chapter four pretty much talks about the ways, the different ways that God speaks to us. So there are many different ways that God speaks to us and we are going to dive deeper and to see the different ways that he speaks to us uh, when he spoke back in the Old Testament days by way of the Bible scriptures, as well as in the New Testament days and how he speaks to us right now in the present by way of his Holy Spirit. So I know a lot of people get confused and they're like, okay, God can speak to me audibly, which is maybe like a still small voice. If you're hearing that voice, it's going to say, hey, do X, Y, and Z. Or some people may hear God speak to them or uh, by way of visions and dreams. You know, that's one way that God speaks to me by way of visions and dreams. I can go to bed and he'll give me a dream. And that next day will be like confirmation to what it is that he wants me to do or say. He also will speak to me by way of visions. I can just be sitting in my living room or doing some work and God will speak to me and will literally give me a vision of something that he wants me to do and or say. Um, so yeah, God can speak to you uh, in other ways as far as through the voice of prophet, um, his messengers or his people. Someone may come and say that there is a word from the Lord that they that he gave them to give to you. But also we know in the Bible as well to beware of false prophets. So you have to be careful with that as well by testing the spirit um, of the Lord when it comes to uh, prophets giving you words and revelations from God. God also speaks to us by way of things, people, places, and things. Um, he can speak to us by way of a sermon that somebody might be preaching. He can also speak to us by way um by way of things, we might see uh, signs of different things like that, whether it's in a car, in a home, um, in a street sign and something. God is amazing. He is omnipresent. He is all knowing. He is omniscient. He is everywhere. He knows what he is doing and how to get our attention. So yes, without further ado, we are going to go ahead. You won't see me in this next clip. You will hear me though. We are going to read chapter four. Once chapter four is read, I am then going to come back to you and I am going to give you a challenge so that you can go in your prayer and in your study time and ask God what it is that he wants for you and what he wants for you to do so that you can do it the right way. So I will see you guys in a few. What's better than a burning bush? Chapter four, when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he, he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. John sixteen thirteen. All of this stuff about our conscious and inner voice and being given a new batch of wants and desires is nice to think about, but it, but it also sounds like a lot of hard work. Have you ever just wished God would show you his will in a tangible, sensational way like he did so many times in scripture? Something you can see or hear with your normal physical senses? Of course you have. So have I. Whenever I read about the miraculous ways God often chose to lead the Israelites, I can't help but envy them. I mean, how incredible would it be for something as conspicuous as a cloud of fire to appear suddenly over your head and begin moving in the precise direction you were supposed to follow? That'd take a lot of the guesswork out, wouldn't it? I tell you, I'd love it. And sometimes I long for it. In fact, today would be a nice day for it, as I'm right in the throes of trying to determine whether God would have me take on a new project that's on the horizon. 
Looking at both the Old and New Testaments, we see him speaking to his people in so many incredible ways. A burning bush in Exodus 3-4 and burning hearts, Luke 24-32. His glory, Numbers 14-22 and his humiliation, Philippians 2-8. and 8. A fire in Deuteronomy 5.24 and in a cloud, Matthew 17.5. His name, Joshua 9 and 9, and his creation, Romans 1 and 20. Visible signs, Judges 6 and 40, and an invisible spirit, Matthew 10 and 20. Visions, Psalms 89 and 19, and dreams, Matthew 2 and 12. Teachers, Ecclesiastes 1 and 1, and evangelists, Acts 8 and 35. Angels, Daniel 8 and 15, and apostles, 2 Peter 3 and 2. And the list goes on. Often the Bible doesn't tell us exactly how he chose to speak, only that the Lord spoke. And those who heard him weren't in any doubt about who was talking or what he was saying. Whether he spoke to reveal his character or to give specific direction, his voice was clear, unmistakable from the very beginning of time. And no matter what the method he chose, he has spoken in ways that could be plainly understood, revealing his deep desire to make sure that communication between himself and his children was possible. And though his methods have changed through the centuries for his own wise and sovereign reasons, his goal has not. He has always wanted his children to hear, recognize, and obey his voice. He wanted it then, he wants it now. Let's trail back through a little biblical history to prove it. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son, the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature, Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. History speaks. One of the ways God spoke to his people as a whole in Old Testament times was through the person of a prophet. And the main way could in the main way people could confirm the prophet's message was through a visible sign. Prophecy and signs went hand in hand. For example, when God wanted to warn his people about worshiping false gods in the prophet Elijah's day, he instructed his servant to speak to them at Mount Carmel, 1 Kings 18. Wouldn't you love to have been there for this divine display of God's authority? First, Elijah challenged them to make up their minds who they were going to serve, God or Baal. And what the people wouldn't say, he proposed a little contest. The prophets of Baal would select two bulls. They would place one of the bulls on their own altar and call out to their God. Elijah would lay the other bull on God's altar and call in the name of the Lord. Whichever one answered by setting the wood of the altar on fire would be revealed as the one true God. Fair enough. Well, this is when things got really fascinating because despite their frantic efforts to get Baal to respond to them, nothing happened. Elijah even upped the antic by instructing that water be poured over the bull on the altar of the Lord. All that commotion and then nothing. But when Elijah walked up to the altar of the Lord and prayed, the fire of God immediately flashed from heaven and licked up the offering. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. First Kings 18, 39. First the prophet's message, then the visible sign to confirm it. This happened numerous times in numerous ways all throughout the Old Testament. For example, Exodus 16, 4 through 36 and First Kings 17, 1 through 7. Things changed, however, when Christ came. The son was the father's message to all mankind, a complete revelation of who he is and what his purposes are. No longer were prophets one of the primary ways God spoke to his people. When Jesus came and walked the earth, God began speaking through the person of his son. And he, in turn, confirmed God's word through miracles. Christ and miracles work hand in hand. We see this, for instance, in his raising of Lazarus from the dead. The message was he was delivering to his people at that moment was this. I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never, ever die. John eleven twenty five through 26. So to confirm the truth of this message, he performed a miracle called calling his friend Lazarus back to life four days after the man's death. What reason did people have for believing he was telling the truth when he spoke of being the resurrection and the life? Well, how about putting a dead man back on his feet again? Jesus backed up his word with miracles. But as he approached the time of his death, things would change yet again. He told his disciples that he was about to leave the world and would be going to his father. But I tell you the truth, he said to them, it is to your advantage that I go away. 
For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. John 16, 7. And how? When the Holy Spirit arrived in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost with loud noise, rushing wind and tongues of fire, there was no denying that God was the source of this new development. And by enabling believers to actually receive the spirit inside themselves, God initiated the most personal way he still speaks to us today directly through the Holy Spirit, hand in hand with scripture. See, in Old Testament times, not everyone who believed in Yahweh had the Holy Spirit also. He only came to specific people at a specific time in order to achieve a specific task. Whenever that task was accomplished or sooner, if the person sinned and rebelled, the mantle and empowerment of the Holy Spirit was withdrawn. Judges 16, 20, 1 Samuel 18, 12. But after Jesus ascended to the Father, the Spirit became a permanent fixture in the lives of all believers. And ever since, he has attempted to reveal the mind of God individually and continually to every saint willing to listen. Hold on then, if things changed at Pentecost with the giving of the Holy Spirit, why is the remainder of the book of Acts, the chronicle of the first century church, still replete with miracle, miraculous activity? Why was God still making his presence known in sensational ways and ways appealing to the five physical senses, even after the Spirit had come? The apostles and their close associates performed miracles in the early years of the church for the same reason Jesus had performed them, to confirm his spoken word which had not yet been fully recorded. But once his word was written down, there was no longer a need to reply, rely on miracles as the sole validation of what he said. This doesn't mean that God can't or doesn't still perform miracles. It just means we don't have to depend on them to know when God is speaking. We have his word. We have his spirit. The Bible and the Holy Spirit go hand in hand. While each stage of God's chosen means of communication was different, his primary purpose has always clearly been the same, to allow believers to clear the chance to hear his voice. So he carefully considered the best means for this to happen in the Old Testament, then during Christ's earthly ministry, and now after Christ's return to heaven. Like believers of old, we are still beneficiaries of a certainly considered divinely selected option that the Father has chosen for those he loves. When God speaks, he does not give new revelation about himself that contradicts what he has already revealed in the scripture. Rather, God speaks to give application of his word to specific circumstances in your life. When God speaks to you, he is applying to your life what he has already said in his word. Henry and Richard Blackaby primarily powerful. Does that disappoint you? This modern method of stillness and sanctification of quiet listening for the spirit's voice within you and finding confirmation through his word. Do you think it's somehow second rate, second best? Would that burning bush still do it for you as opposed to all this prayer and study and patience and subtly? Believe me, I know the feeling. It's so tempting just to want his voice to be big and bold, erupting on us all at once at high noon. Getting answers to our big questions about which school to put our children in, which church to join, which job to apply for, which doctor to choose, illuminated by a blowout sign from heaven that leaves no doubt which direction we should go. What could top that? But consider this. While we often wish we had what the people of God enjoyed in Old Testament days, I think they probably would have preferred what we have today, the special blessing of the Holy Spirit. They had no choice but to rely on prophets and visible signs since they did not experience the Holy Spirit as fully as we do in this age of the church. We possess a blessing they could only hope for, direct personal contact with the living God. Even though his voice may sometimes be hard to discern without careful, deliberate discipline and self-denial, it's a gift that ages past would have envy. That's why we find the psalmist pleading, don't take your Holy Spirit from me, Psalm 51 11. So instead of wishing that God would do something to reveal his will to us, we should celebrate the fact that he has already done something, something mind-blowingly dazzling by giving us the most precious gift of all and by providing an avenue to make his voice heard and known. Every time we kneel in prayer or read his word and receive even a faint whisper of his wisdom, counsel, or conviction through his spirit within us, we're enjoying a privilege our Old Testament brothers and sisters would have enjoyed immensely in their day-to-day -day relationship with the Lord. The most spectacular way God has ever spoken to his people is the way he speaks to us right now, through the indwelling, intimate, incredible gift of his Holy Spirit and the timeless living, holy word of God. And if we insist on speaking to hear him only or even primarily in sensational ways, the open parking spot, the flip of a coin, the blindfolded pointing at a single Bible verse, we will miss out on the most personal means of communication possible with him. Be encouraged by this, my friend. It's better than a burning bush.
But wait, lest you think I've glossed over and quit believing that God can speak in obvious, tangible ways. I want to tell you something. While his primary means of communicating with us may be the glorious, gentle voice of his internal Holy Spirit and his word. And while I'll freely admit that my normal experience with him is not a wash in Red Seas, Jordan Rivers and talking donkeys. I'm not saying for one minute that God doesn't still specialize in miracles. He performs them all the time. I wish I can sit with you in a couple of rocking chairs on the front porch of some little bed and breakfast somewhere and spend the whole morning reading your entries from my journal. Then you'd know I wasn't playing. God still intervenes in our world to make sick bodies well, to heal fractured emotions, to remove addictive desires from people's lips, to put $150 in the pocket of someone whose specific need is not $100, not $200, but exactly $150. Ask around and you'll find somebody who's seen this sort of stuff happen up close and firsthand. I know I've seen it. Miracles. God's handiwork. As believers in Christ, we can pray for and expect them from our, whole, our Heavenly Father in accordance with His superior wisdom and timing. So when I say we shouldn't rely on the marvelous and miraculous in order to receive information from His throne, I'm not saying we should stop anticipating it. He has not quite been as being as He has not quit being astonishing. Our relationship with Him will still very often deal in the supernatural. That's what life in the Spirit is all about. He is neither unable or, nor unwilling to cause this combination of the spirit and the word to astonish now and them. Leave room for God to be God. Who are we to say what he cannot or will not do? I know some of some very godly, biblical grounded people who have heard from him in ways that a lot of us consider highly unorthodox. Yet, I don't discount the sincerity of their encounter with God just because it's something I haven't experienced or would never expect of him myself. I know God won't operate in a manner that contradicts his word or proves him to be acting inconsistently with the truth of his character. But just because we have a Bible and know our way around it pretty well doesn't mean we know everything about him or that some of our preconceived notions aren't little more than vain attempts to limit the Almighty. I'd expect he wouldn't mind shaking those up a little sometimes. Several years ago, in fact, God very, very clearly spoke to me in a way that I'd never experienced before. It was new. It was a bit uncomfortable, but it was so obviously God that I'd have been a fool to mistake it for anything or anyone else. It all started when I began sensing that the Lord wanted me to take a new direction spiritually and personally. I felt as if I'd become someone ingrown and partially blinded by the safety and familiarity of my Christian experience up to that point. My spiritual foundations had been sound and those who had helped me establish them were sincere and faithful saints. But there are times for stretching ourselves, for seeing what God will do beyond what we expect. And I had begun to sense this burning in my heart, compelling me to expand my territory and increase my capacity, preparing me to experience God in a novel and fresh way. I was hesitant about this. My personality is often a bit adverse to change. I was a little fearful about what this would mean, not only for myself, but also for the ministry the Lord had entrusted to me. It would have been a lot easier just to bed down and make camp where I was already spiritually settled and established. But based on what I was hearing from him in my personal prayer and Bible study, I knew the Holy Spirit was urging me to go exploring. For some reason, as part of my beginning stages of obedience in this area, I attended a brand new Bible study. I didn't know anyone in the group and no one knew me, which is exactly how I wanted it, just in case things got weird and I needed to sneak out the back door. But at the end of the teacher's message that first night, he looked over in my direction and said something extraordinary. It was a good thing I had come. Now, before I fully relate the rest of this story, I want to clarify some things. I believe that the word of knowledge and prophecy, 1 Corinthians 12, 8 and 10, are very real gifts of the spirit that the New Testament believers can be given as he chooses to distribute them. Yes, I fully understand the differences of opinions on this, but I see no reason for these gifts to be singled out for exclusion from the biblical texts and listings. There, I said it. And even though I do not believe that prophetic messages that either add or take away from the scriptures can be received as messages from God. I do believe that the spirit gives to some people on certain occasions, the divine ability to receive insight into another person's life. And when this happens, that believer has the opportunity and responsibility, frankly, to share this scriptural message that applies to the other person's situation and affirms God's voice and direction. You don't have to agree with me as long as you keep on reading. The Bible study leader said to me that even that evening, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but I just feel prompted to share something with you. I began to 
did pray for you when you first came in and the Lord gave me a mental picture of an old rickety train track. It was an incident, an ancient, but it was sturdy. Then all of a sudden, a futuristic streamlined train filled to the brim with passengers came roaring down the tracks. I'd never seen a train like this one before. It was new and unique, but was squarely fitted on that old firm track. Young lady, I believe the Lord wants to do something new in your life, and it's going to be hard for you to imagine because it will be something you've never seen or experienced before. But there's no need to be afraid because the old, strong, solid foundation of his holy word will be what this upcoming work will find its footing on. And by the way, this is not just about you. There are a lot of people who will be coming along for the ride with you. The tears were coming now. A kind stranger next to me handed me a tissue while the Bible teacher continued. Forget about what's happened, he said, quoting from Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. Don't keep going over old history. Be alert. Be present. I'm about to do something brand new. It's bursting out. Don't you see it? There it is. Well, well, needless to say, this message shook me to the core. To be honest, I didn't know what to do with it other than believe it with it was God himself. Hearing him like this was unconventional for me, but I couldn't deny the relevance of what the teacher had said. Based on the inner witness of the Holy Spirit, I knew God was speaking to me. So I just embraced it and kept my eyes open for the brand new experiences he would bring my direction for his glory and the further advancement of his kingdom. Not merely because I'd heard him in this particular way, spectacular way, differently from my typical method of hearing the spirit's voice, but because it totally confirmed what he had already been telling me. Remember us talking about the mercy of confirmation in the five M's from chapter two? And wow, has his message proven true in the years since. God has expanded our opportunities to serve the body of Christ in ways unique to our previous experiences. Through a series of events, of events we became connected with ministries to orphans in Uganda, anti-sex trafficking efforts to rescue enslaved young women in Greece, and women's shelters in North America. Our ministry has been refocused from merely teaching from a speaker's platform to actually prioritizing outreach efforts that assist in the practical transformation of people's lives today. The journey has been beyond belief and far beyond myself for his glory. The lesson to learn from this, I believe, is twofold. God is definitely able to amaze us with his miraculous prayers his miraculous answers to prayers or the occasional electrifying clarity of his message. This is part of how he speaks to us and we ought to have our spiritual ears open to it, but we must not depend on these as if that's the only way we'll receive a word from him. Such bombshells and surprises do not lay the foundation for us to hear him. Rather, he may choose to give them at special times to provide confirmation of the messages we've already been receiving from the pages of scripture and the spirit's counsel. He has not promised to lead us in a way that appeals to one of our five senses, but rather to our spirits by the leading of the Holy Spirit within us. For all who are being led by the spirit of God are children of God, Romans eight fourteen. As his spirit speaks, personalizing his message in a vast variety of ways, we hear his voice inside us, compelling, encouraging, convicting, challenging, teaching, and guiding us right smack dab into his will for our lives. Hey guys, so we have heard everything that we need to know and the three main points of how God chooses to speak to us when it was by way of the Old Testament, the New Testament, and in our current times. So I'm coming to you with a challenge, and I want you to talk to me down in the comment section and let me know your thoughts and your opinions and um, and your revelations as to what you got out of today's chapter. So our first challenge, I want you to make sure that the following biblical template is in your knowledge base. Number one, One of the primary ways God spoke in the Old Testament was, as we saw, through the prophets and the visible signs. Number two, the primary way God spoke during Jesus's earthly ministry was through his son and his miracles. And lastly, our third point, the primary way God speaks today is through his word and his spirit. Now, our next challenge 
Consider the primary way you've been depending on to hear God. And I want you to recommit yourself to the chief means that he has chosen for this age. My next challenge is to get some external activity should primarily serve as your confirmation, not the foundation of hearing God. I want you to evaluate whether you've been too quickly reacting and making big decisions based on outside observations alone and make sure that it came truly from God. As we spoke before, try the spirit by the spirit. All confirmations, when a prophet comes to you, they are just messengers giving you insight and revelations from God, which is nothing but confirmation because as we know, the same God that can speak to the prophets can speak to you too if you invite him into your heart and you develop a personal relationship with him so that you can hear him clearly. God will then impart the spirit of discernment so that you will know what is true and what is not. I want you to remain open and I want you to be willing to experience God in ways that are different from what you are accustomed to, as long as they do not contradict his word. My motto for this year is, if it's not of God, I don't want it. If it's not from God, I don't want it. If it's not God, I don't want to hear it, see it, listen, or do it. So make sure that whenever you feel like you are hearing from God, whether it's a confirmation or a sign of something, make sure that it does not contradict the word of God. If it contradicts the word of God, then it's not from him, but it is from the opposite side. So you have to make sure that you are spending time with him so that you can then allow the Holy Spirit to impart in you so that you can discern and know whether that word was from God or whether that word was delivered demonically, okay? And then my last thing to you is to commit yourself to praying for a complete openness to God's spirit. In order for God to come into your your heart. You have to open your heart and invite him in, okay? It's like having someone come to you, your house unannounced. People don't like it, right? So God, he wants to come to you, but you have to be willing to accept him into your life. You have to be willing to accept him into your heart. He's not going to force you. He's not going to do anything. He's sitting right there waiting for you. So all you have to do is say, God, I welcome you in to my life so that I can be able to hear you clearly and know what it is that you want for me to do. So I want you to consider these challenges by way of this chapter. We read chapter four, what's better than a burning bush. Take these challenges, pray on them, ask God to help you and to reveal to you what it is that he wants you to do and or say. And I want you to come back with us because on next Friday, Next Friday, we are going to dive into part two, the section part two of this book, and we're going to recognize the sound of his voice by diving into chapter five, which is called He is Persistent, okay? So I want to leave a scripture with you, and then I am going to let you go. In John 16, 13, it says, when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to what is to come. I want you to take this information with you. I want you to dwell on that scripture and other scriptures that we have talked about today in the reading of our book. And until next time, remember that I love you, but God loves you so much more. Meet us again next Friday at 7 p.m. Central Time for our next reading for chapter five of our book club. Bye.